Welcome to the Book Cliffs of Utah, one of the most studied, most analyzed, most visited outcrop belts probably in the world. There's been thousands of papers written about it, thousands of field trips been led here. In fact, in a few days, I'm going to be leading another field trip out here. There's been books written about it. There's been all kinds of ideas and theories written about it. It's because the outcrops are so, so good. They're spectacular expressions of Cretaceous shore face and deltaic deposits and some fluvial systems in there. Each one of these sandstone tongues has a name. There's the Aberdeen, the Kenilworth, the Grassy, the Sunnyside, and so on. This is like the textbook area for sedimentologists and stratigraphers. I love it! <laughs> Come on! I'm not going to be looking at the usual stuff on this trip, though. In fact, what I'm going to be looking at is some of the stuff down below. I'm not looking at shore faces and deltas and fluvial systems. I'm going to be looking at some of the offshore material, some of the channels and some of the fans that came out from these feeder systems that were being sourced by deltas. But when those deltas overrode and had too much sediment coming in, that sand went down slope and created channel systems on the pro delta and the basin floor on the shelf. So I'm going to be looking at one of these channel fills out here. And if you'd like to see it, Come along with me, we're gonna see some really cool geology. Let me set the context for you as we're walking out to the first stop along this little traverse. Uh, 75 to 80 million years ago during the Campanian stage of the Cretaceous, this whole area was under marine waters. And that's because subsidence of the Western Interior Basin, which was brought about by tectonic loading by the severe mountains and incipient laramide uplifts, caused the entire region to sag. And it actually subsided below sea level. So the Gulf of Mexico and the Arctic Ocean were able to flood the entire mid-continent, creating the Western Interior Sea. At the same time, sediment that was being eroded from the surrounding uplifts, like the severe and the incipient laramide uplifts, was prograding out into the sea, creating these big deltas and shore faces, which were fed by rivers. And just like in modern systems, when the supply of sediment and water carried by the rivers exceeded the capacity of the deltas and the shore faces to store it all, it went blowing past them out into the marine basin, creating submarine channels and lobes of sediment. As we're getting closer to the outcrop, it's always good to kind of stop every so often and get your bearings and take a look. And this is a great chance to do that. You can really see really nicely the change in sediment style and architectural style from bottom to top of this cliff. Starting at the top and working our way down because that's the way drillers like to do it. Sedimentologists and stratigraphers, we don't like to do that, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll start here and you know start at the top and work our way down. The upper sand, and this is sandstone and shale, I should mention. The grayer material is shale. It's kind of a silty mudstone. And the buff and tan color stuff is sandstone. So that upper sandstone is kind of gnarly looking, um, kind of pillowy looking. Um, that's a combination of upper shore face and fluvial deposits, estuarine deposits. The next one down, the kind of tanner material, the lighter color material is more horizontally bedded. And that's more of a shore face uh, delta front deposit. So wave dominated deltaic shore face deposit. Then we get into the mudstones and the muds have these little ledges of silt and resistant material sticking out in sand, silt. Those are little pro-delta tongues that have kind of shot out in front of the delta. But the feature we're interested in is at the very base of the cliff, um, it's the first resistant ridge in the mudstone. And you can kind of see it's got a little bit of a dish shape to it. So that's what we're gonna go take a look at. It looks like it's scoured out, looks like it's a dish. It's been interpreted as a submarine channel. And that's what we're gonna go take a look at. All right, we're closer yet to this thing. You know, with geology students and even professionals, a lot of times you got to stop them from running immediately up to the outcrop. They just want to run up to it and start looking. You kind of got to work your way up to it. You got to see things from afar. If your nose is right up against a rock, sometimes there are features and characteristics that you just can't see. You're too close. It's the whole forest for trees thing, right? So here, you know, that lower ledge, which back there, it's kind of ambiguous. Does it look like it's actually scouring it or not? But take a look at that side on the right. And sure enough, it looks like there's a scour. It looks like it's cutting into the underlying shale, that gray Mancos shale. All right, we are right up on it now. And you can see, this is the left side. It does look like it's got a heterolithic fill, just meaning it looks like a combination of sand and maybe some silt or mud, giving that discrete layering. If it was homogenous, you wouldn't get that. 
And sure enough, when you follow the ridge across, you can see it's weathering out differently. So the sand is probably the more resistant feature and the mud and silt is less resistant. And then coming across, lo and behold, it does look like it's cut down into the underlying marine shale. That's a shellful shale, meaning it's below storm wave base. Um, it's actually a pro delta shale or mudstone in this case, because this mud is all being delivered by big Cretaceous deltas. And the important thing to observe with the sandy body that's cut into it is those individual layers go across and then pinch out on that surface, the erosional surface. So they actually truncate on the surface. Uh, they're onlapping that incision surface. So that's telling you that they're not just, um, this is not an odd artifact of weathering after the thing was deposited. So we didn't have homogeneous continuous layers going all the way across. We have different layers. We have sand and silt pinching out against the flank of that channel body of the, uh, of the channel scour. So that's an interpretation from back here you know, about 100 yards away. Now we'll get up close and see what's actually going on in it. You know, I forgot to mention as we approach this body, uh, there's actually two ways you could possibly interpret this thing. Um, it looks like it's scoured in, looks like it's a channel, and it looks heterolithic. And it looks like the sand and silt or mud layers are kind of onlapping that scour. It's cutting into a marine shale, a pro-deltaic mud, so one hypothesis that we can test by looking at it in a minute here is that it's actually a fluvial channel, a river that's cut down into the delta after sea level fell. Maybe sea level fell during the Cretaceous sequence boundary. I'm not going to get into that in this video, but I'll do a video about what sequence boundaries are and whether there are any out here in the book cliffs at all. You won't want to miss that one. So it's possible, you know, something similar happened off the coast of New Jersey during the Ice Age with the Hudson River creating the Hudson River Canyon um, on the Texas Gulf Coast, the Brazos, Colorado, Trinity Rivers, all those incised into the marine shelf when sea level fell. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that sea level did not fall, and that's a subaqueous marine canyon, a submarine canyon. And that's the hypothesis that's most popular lately. Uh, a lot of, or at least a few papers have been published about it. But we're going to take a look at it and see if there's anything that tilts us one direction or the other. Just because it's been published in a paper doesn't always mean it's right. That's science. Science changes. New observations lead to new interpretations. So we're going to go take a look at it and see, can we differentiate it from a fluvial channel? Is it really a submarine channel? Or is it, are we in for a shocking surprise? I really don't know. We're about to find out. Working our way up the hillside. Here's some talus blocks. You know how I love my talus blocks. And they're not really blocks, they're flakes, but look at that, there's ripples on them. So we've got ripples on that. There's some larger ripples over here. So we do have ripples. I'm not seeing much in the way of trace fossils though. But we got a lot of talus to look at before we get to the outcrop. Well, the lighting is just absolutely perfect for this outcrop at this time. Here's that sand, that heterolithic sand, and sure enough, it's a fine to very fine grained sand with some silt and sand in between. It's wavy, it's rippled, and look at that sharp incision. There is a sharp, sharp incision into the underlying laminated silty mudstone. Let's take a closer look at this silty laminated mudstone underneath. So earlier I said it's cutting into a shelf, and I kind of corrected myself, you know, when I was talking about this channel cutting into the shelf. And I said, well, you know, it's a marine shelf, it's a mudstone. In reality, shelf mudstone would be 100% bioturbated, chewed up. There would be a lot of worms and shrimp and bivalves and crabs. Healthy, healthy marine ecosystem in a marine shelf deposit. This stuff, you can see laminations all the way across, fairly uninterrupted. And more importantly, I don't see any big, robust vertical burrows, no feeding burrows, nothing really. And that's typical of a pro-delta. That's because there's a lot of freshwater and terrestrial mud and organics blowing out of that delta front and creating a hypopycno plume of muds and organics. And marine organisms do not like that. They can't tolerate fresh water. They don't like the terrestrial organics. So pro-delta deposits tend to be devoid of trace fossils like this. So this is a pro-delta. Now our next question is, is this channel-shaped feature 
a fluvial channel or a tidal channel or something like that. So the hypothesis I proposed down the hill was that this could be an incised fluvial channel. So sea level fell, the channel incised, and then sea level rose again on top of it. Let's run through our checklist of what we know about fluvial channels and see if this fits the bill for that. So first of all, it's incised. It's got a scour. It's got a basal channel shape. One. Okay, good. That doesn't really tell us anything, though, because so do submarine channels. Two. Does it have a basal lag of conglomerate rip-up clasts or tree branches or things like that? And the answer is no, it doesn't have that. Instead, what we've got is a sharp contact and it's very fine grain sand with some silt and little bits of mineral precipitate might have been shell at one time, but no lag deposit like you would see at the base of a fluvial channel. All right, so we're lacking one. What about evidence of bars? Um, do we see anything fining up, any bars or anything like that? And the answer is no. We've got lamination, low angle lamination, a little bit of contorted bedding, lots of ripples, just stacks and stacks of ripples and undulatory bedding, suggesting, you know, moderate current, but we're not seeing beds, we're not seeing bars, we're not seeing dunes, we're not seeing three-dimensional um, trough cross bedding or planar cross bedding, we're not, not seeing anything big. So you get in the sense that this is actually a fairly kind of low energy little channel, not building big dunes or or bars or anything. Now, part of that might be because it's such a fine grain deposit. Um, the grains are just so fine, you can only develop smaller scale dunes. But then you see features like that and you say, well, no, I think that's part of the flow. It's just not, not a super high energy flow. It's just kind of um, enough to transport silt and sand and mud, but not enough to develop anything big. So we're not seeing fluvial characteristic bars and beds is the point. Uh, it doesn't seem to fine up. That's another fluvial channel characteristic. This starts off heterolithic and it ends heterolithic. It doesn't change. So there's no lateral accretion either. We don't see, again, with the bars over there in that far distant one, looks like there might be some uh, angled bedding. So it might be kind of laterally accreting, but it's not super clear. So we'll score lateral accretion as a question mark. I'd say there might be some accretion. That happens in some marine channels too, though. It's not unique to fluvial channels. So I guess the point is right here, we're not seeing anything indicative of a fluvial channel. So, so far from our observation of the base and the initial bedding in here and looking across the way at the maybe low angle accretion sets, there's nothing that screams fluvial channel. And in fact, it's consistent with a submarine channel. It incises, it's got kind of low energy, um, the flows are carrying fine grain material. So, okay, score it for a submarine channel. Let's take a walk up to the pinch out. We'll follow the scour across, see where it pinches out, and then take a look up at the top. Still plenty of light to do that. Let's go. So we'll just kind of mosey along the cliff here, make observations as we go. There's some ripples in a talus flake. Lots of ripples. And yeah, again, there's lots of low angle bedding, lots of ripple bedding. Um, some of this looks even suspiciously, I'm not gonna say it is, but it looks suspiciously like it's trying to approach swales and hummocks maybe. Now, I'm not saying that's hummocky and swaley, but it's, it certainly is approaching that, which indicates you're below a fair weather wave base and occasionally getting storm waves. You can really see that regular heterolithic nature here, where we're going from the ridges of sand and the recessive units of silty mud, sand, silty mud. Each of those is a little pulse of sediment coming out. So the sand is the base of that pulse of sediment during a big storm or hurricane. And as the flow wanes, you get the mud. Then maybe a decade later, maybe a year later, maybe a hundred years later, the next pulse comes out. So these submarine channels, Phil, just like a delta builds, just like a fluvial channel builds, every time there's a big storm, you wash a whole bunch of sediment into the system, it gets dumped out, and each of those is its own little flow, which again, could represent annual or, or centennial or anything in between flows. We really don't know that. We don't have good enough time scale resolution 
on bodies like this, especially not in the Cretaceous. So let's see what else we see. It's kind of covered here, but we're approaching the end. It's kind of a challenging slope to walk on. Definitely don't want to fall down. Always wear good shoes, by the way. Okay. Seeing lots more of those little small scale ripples in the sand slabs. And yeah, more heterolithic sandy bedding. Pretty regular, very regular flows. Um, look at this, some beautiful little ripples here. Four sets angled that direction. That's heading to the east, southeast, which makes sense because the mountains and the source of the sediment are to the west. Little wavy and laminated beds. Sort of weak little flows. Strong enough to move sediment, but not strong enough to carry coarse grained or build big beds and bars. All right, that's it. That is the end of our little channel here. It continues over that way. We're kind of on the margin and it looks like it continues onto those little hills. Okay, so I got curious and I walked a little bit to the east of our last stop because I spotted what looked like another channel system. And sure enough, here's another one that's got a nice scour cut in to the underlying pro-deltaic mud. You can see a scour crystal clear here. And then it goes across and it looks like it's dipping up on the other side. So we can actually get a pretty good approximation, maybe, of the cross-sectional scale of one of these channels. It looks like there's actually a network of channels. You can see in the background, there are even some back there with slightly different orientations than this one. So it's hard to tell from just a two-dimensional outcrop because of course channels have three-dimensional uh, sinuosity and they stack on each other and next to each other. But it looks like we're dealing with, unsurprisingly, more than just a single channel coming down the Pro Delta. And it looks like there's actually a network of channel systems. So from a distance, it didn't look like too much. And as we got closer, it looked more and more like a little channel. Then the question I came up with is, is it a fluvial channel, a river, or an estuarine channel that cut in during a, uh, a fall in sea level, like happened on the East Coast and the Hudson River or the Texas Gulf Coast? Or is it genuinely a submarine channel that was flowing underwater? And everything we're seeing is consistent with being in a submarine channel. We're not seeing anything typical of fluvial systems. Looks like relatively weak little flows in a confined space off the nose of a delta underwater. So this is, yeah, I totally agree. It's a submarine channel. And in fact, this channel has been implicated, or one like it, has been implicated in feeding what I call the Hatch Mesa mystery sands. Other people call them the Prairie Canyon sands. Um, I did a video on them last year, maybe two years ago at this point. Um, but those are the fans where this channel emptied out onto the seafloor, created these big fans that look like deep water fans. There's turbidite flows. There's also ripples on them, climbing ripples. Um, and even some hummocky and storm beds. There's all kinds of features in there. They're controversial. People like to argue about all the details and intricacies. That's neither here nor there. Are you crazy? Are you? So again, I hope you saw that with just a few basic observations and a little bit of knowledge of analogs and how systems work, you can come out, look at a rock unit, look at a deposit you haven't seen before, or maybe one you've read about and you're not too sure about, you want to make your own opinion. You can come out, make your own observations, see how it tallies up. And at the end of the day, walk away with a pretty good interpretation, I think. As always, thank you for watching, and I will see you on the outcrop. Take care.